Hello, everyone. Welcome to this educational program from the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States. Today, we are talking about addressing the massive global impact of corruption. Our two guests are already here with us. Uh, Ambassador Thonoas Stelzer, he is the Dean and Executive Secretary of the International Anti-Corruption Academy, IACA. He has been a member of the Foreign Service of the Republic of Austria. He has served as permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations Office in Vienna, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test. Ben Treaty Organization, Preparatory Commission, and Ambassador to Portugal from 2013 to 2017. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you so much for um, being here with us today. Thank you. It's a great honor to be with you. But since you are speaking from New York, I should add one small detail to my bio. I was yeah. the UN Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination for quite a number of years uh, for Ban Ki-moon and the Secretary of the CEB, the Chief's Executive Board, in which the Secretary General of the United Nations meets twice a year with the 27 heads of the UN system, which was a very exciting position, of course. And I had the honor to organize nine CEBs, uh, content-wise and organizationally. So that's a part of my bio which I'm very proud of because I've spent my entire diplomatic career in uh -huh. with, for, and uh, in the United Nations, uh, working on global topics and international issues and from disarmament and security issues and uh, over uh, terrorism, fighting, fighting terrorism and uh, to uh, fighting corruption. Perfect. which is the newest the newest global issue which made it to the center of the global agenda exactly and it's part of our, of our daily work i'm actually in washington dc ambassador that's where i work now okay. i am, yes i am um i need to introduce myself as well patricia vasconcelos a board member of the association of foreign correspondents in united states based in washington dc u.s correspondent for SBT Brazilian TV Network. Here with us today also Jonathan Granoff. He's the president of Global Security Institute, permanent observer for the International Anti-Corruption Academy to the United Nations, an attorney, author, and international advocate emphasizing the legal and ethical dimensions of human development and security with a specific focus on advancing the rule of law, international security, anti-corruption and the threats posed by nuclear web weapons. He was a 2014 nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. So welcome, Jonathan Granoff. It's an honor um, to moderate this educational program with both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, in the way, Ambassador, Ambassador Stelzer had a little correction. I'll add one for myself as well. Please, please do it. I'm, I'm also the representative to the United Nations of the World Summits of Nobel Peace Prize winners. So uh, for the last uh, 16 years, each year, the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize have had a conference. And I want to say Ambassador Stelzer is an advisor to that group and has spoken in, in absolutely uh, extemporaneously in an inspirational fashion to the Nobel Peace Prize winners. Uh, and his approach resonates with their approach, which is holistic. In other words, in other words, it, you can't separate, you can't separate the uh, approach to ending the scourge of war, which is the key principle uh -huh. of the UN system. The first resolution of the General Assembly to get rid of weapons of mass destruction, the sustainable development goals, the entire agenda of the UN and the Nobel Peace Prize winners uh -huh. centers around good governance, good go governance at the at the national level, the local level and the international level. So mm -hmm. Ambassador Stelzer has been one of the visionaries pushing the agenda at the international level to mainstream anti-corruption. 
because it's central to success across the board. So I hope that in this dialogue that we have today, we, may, we make it clear to the hundreds of journalists who will see this, that we're not going to be talking about a news cycle item specifically today, like such and such a dictator ran off with billions of dollars, or this company has, uh, has corrupted officials in so many countries, et cetera. We want to make it, give it a deeper background in the issue, why it's important, so that when there is a news cycle item, they will come to Ambassador Stelzer or myself to give the kind of sound bites that contextualize that news cycle item in the larger picture and why it's institutional, why we can, why we can make progress on this issue and why we must make progress on this issue. Right. As you said, corruption makes daily headlines around the world. We foreign journalists, we write, we broadcast stories almost in a daily basis in countries all around the world. However, uh, we believe that little is written or broadcasted about the commitment of the 189 countries that have signed the UN Convention Against Corruption, a, a legally binding treaty. So in order to give an overview and a background to our audience uh, about the achievements of the UN Convention Against Corruption so far, uh, a text that, uh, a content that it was negotiated 20 years ago, and today so many countries still face this problem. So, um, Ambassador Stelzer, could you uh, give us an overview about this convention and um, a, a text that covers five areas, and why are we still fighting corruption? Uh, till nowadays, is is this is this convention not working at all? Well, thank you. This is a very complex issue, of course, because corruption is always mankind. But uh, people were exposed to authorities abusing their power for personal gains. They didn't have any means to stand up against them. So people started accepting corruption as a daily feature in their life, not uh, feeling themselves in a position to fight it. The UN Convention Against Corruption is the first legal instrument that gives us the basis to fight corruption globally on the basis of the rule of law, efficiently excluding impunity if implemented. Now, the convention as such has many different parts. It's seven chapters, you know, dealing with uh, prevention, with, you know, with, 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 many, with all relevant issues criminalizing of corruption. We, when we negotiate, I'm, I think I'm still, still the last still active negotiator of this convention. You know, I was uh, part of the negotiating committee and I led the negotiations on the implementation chapter, uh, the last chapter. But of course I participated in all the other issues too. And the big issue was what is corruption? Can we agree on a definition? We couldn't at that time. You know, we wanted to achieve consensus. We wanted to come up with an instrument that we can all agree, which makes it weak. And in some issues, it makes it also uh, indecisive, you know, not concrete enough. Concrete, just concrete enough that we could all accept it. Now, we all understood what corruption is. You know, the abuse of authority for, for personal gains. But then corruption has to be criminalized in each country. So by introducing the provisions of the convention in all the countries, we criminalize corruption. So corruption looks a little different in each one of the countries. Some have a narrower, some have a wider notion of corruption. Some countries include football referees, nationals who lead games in other countries, you know, under, the, under this uh, convention, others don't. So it's just a slight differences, but we all understand what corruption is. So this convention tells us how to build systems which are resilient to corruption based on legal norms and societal. This has to come together. So we have to create a penal system, a legal system, strong norms that make us, make, put us in the position to fight corruption and to exclude impunity. At the same time, we have to introduce these norms into daily life. As Jonathan has said, as you have also referred to, this convention has 
been ratified in the meantime by 189 countries. So it's a global convention. Most countries of the world have ratified this convention, translating the norms, the provisions of the convention into national legislation. So national legislative bodies, parliaments, have introduced this convention in national law. So countries have committed to implement this convention, to fight corruption, and they have mandated executive branches, their governments, to implement the laws. So fighting corruption today is not arbitrary anymore. 189 countries have committed to do it. And that also refers to your second question. Uh, what is the impact of this convention? Mm -hmm. Now, as we know, uh, that very often we get together in the framework of the United Nations, we invest enormous efforts to come up with the result. We work on a convention, we agree on a convention, we produce consensus, but then often we don't have the energy to implement what we have come up with. And many conventions have become dead wood. Now, I wanted to not to let this happen to our anti-corruption convention because I thought it was too important, not only because I was a negotiator. By the way, I also had the honor to sign this convention on behalf of my own country, Austria. So my own signature is on the convention paper. So my ink has been absorbed by the convention paper, uh, links me inseparably, also emotionally, emotionally to this convention. But I thought this convention was too important that we can let it wither away. So my idea was, what can we do to help implement this convention in daily life? How can, you know, today, many countries have very nearly impeccable normative systems against corruption. But still, there is no country in the world without corruption. You know, in some countries more, in some countries less. But on the famous uh, Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, no country has 100 points. So each country has space to improve. Why? Because the normative systems are not met by the reality. There's a huge gap in some countries between the law and the implementation. And this is where my organization comes in, the International Anti-Corruption Academy. We provide technical assistance and capacity building to practitioners, lawyers, judges, prosecutors, justitional personnel, academics, to learn to understand the complex provisions of the convention better and to translate this law into their daily life, into their professions. That's our main uh, job. Capacity building tech assistance to practitioners to make sure that this convention is being translated into the life of the constituents, of the people who should benefit uh, from this progress. Uh, I want to hear more um, very soon about the IACA and explain um, its work. Uh, before, uh, Ambassador, I would like to hear from uh, Mr. Granov um, about the, um, uh, the convention, uh, as the author was saying about for example, the preventive measures to fight corruption, criminalization, law enforcement, international cooperation, asset recovery, technical assistance, information exchange. Um, from your perspective, um, which measures to fight corruption are not working in many countries and how to improve that? Let me give a contextualization of why it's so central. Um, Please. Because corruption undermines all aspects of social, political, and economic and moral development in a society. Every one of those issues is impacted by corruption. Mm -hmm. The sustainable development goals are the human security agenda for the future. They are the counterweight to, uh, to the pursuit of security through military means and domination and threat of use of weapons. That's, that's one model of security. The other model is working together to address protecting the climate, pulling people out of poverty. SDG Sustainable Development Goal 16, which all the nations of the world have agreed upon in the same way as the convention, is founded on the concept of good governance, the importance of good governance applies to all of the existential threats that humanity faces, how we deal with pandemics, how we protect the oceans, how we deal with a financial system, which if, if there's massive corruption in one stock market, it could take the whole system down. 
We live in a very integrated world. So corruption in one place can affect, can affect the entire system. When you look, for example, just you drill down to one case, the Odebrecht case. The Odebrecht case was a corrupt country in Brazil, but it was corrupting institutions and political systems in Angola, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Guatemala, Mexico, Mozambique, Panama, Peru, and Venezuela. 75 of the officers of the company were prosecuted. So that's just one example of one corrupt business, global impact, local impact, people's daily lives affected by it. So the convention sets out a norm and sets out principles that 189 countries have agreed need to be applied. Mm -hmm. um, corruption is uh, in scope. Let's just get a sense of what we're talking about. Um, according, to, uh, according to most experts, there's at least seven to $14 trillion sitting on the sidelines from the legitimate economies of the world. We don't, it's, it's at least seven, but it may, be, but, but many authorities say it's up to 14, 15. Okay. We know, according to the Secretary General of the UN, it's, it's in excess of two and a half trillion a year taken out of the legitimate economies. That's the kind of money that could be used to address pandemics, protect the climate, fulfill an agenda for security of sustainable development, that's not an option. It's not an option. We can have plan A and plan B, but there's no planet B. We have to, we have to get that, those resources. Now we had thought that when the Cold War ended, that we would have a peace dividend. But we know now, particularly in the, in the midst of a, a shadow of a, of a horrible war in the Ukraine. Uh, and even before that, we saw that the military appropriations since 2000 have globally exceeded uh, o o over $25 trillion. So the peace dividend isn't going to happen for political reasons. And right now it's, it's not even on the table anywhere. But there is this money to be seized that belongs to the people of the world. And we have a name for it. It's called the integrity dividend. And the elements of that integrity are, the, coming back to your question, are the principles of the, uh, the UN Convention Against Corruption. Accountability, rule of law, transparency, all of the elements that we know, that we know work. We know that these, we know that these principles can be applied. So, uh, there's a real need for capacity building, for educating people in the methodologies to do this. Not just governments, not just governments, but, uh, uh, but the business community, uh, the financial community. And we could talk a little bit about capturing illicit financial transactions, because that's substantial and can be, and there are avenues in which progress can be made. And there's journalist stories to be told about how that progress can be made. And I, I hope we get into that. In other words, avenues in which journalists can, uh, can really shine. And I'm not talking about the deep, deep commitment of 150 journalists you know, in the Panama Papers, a fantastic effort, a fantastic, courageous effort in some instances. I'm talking about just making it in the public mind, anti-corruption, is a central political issue for my community, for my nation and the world. And that's why the convention is so important. It sets forth that universal principle. Let me get one thing before I finish. Um, 50 years ago, uh, the importance of gender equity was not mainstream. Today it is, and I'm glad it is. It's the right thing to do. A bird can't fly without both wings. And women were completely degraded for thousands of years in our civilizations. That's no, no one tolerates that anymore. The idea that we have to have gender balance is mainstreamed for the good of us all. We have to mainstream anti-corruption. 
And that's, that's, that's why journalists are so important in this effort. They have to own this issue the way journalists have come to own gender equity. They've come to own that issue. And uh, 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 capturing the integrity dividend, they have to own that too. Thank you so much. And that's why um, this, this educational program, it's so important to, to analyze and to understand all actors involved in this, in, in fighting this problem all, all over the world. So Ambassador uh, Stelzer, you were the Dean and Executive Secretary of the International Anti-Corruption Academy, IACA, which is a global, global organization. Uh, and if I am not wrong, uh, it was initiated by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, Interpol, European Anti-Fraud Office, uh, the Republic of Austria, uh, all the, and other stakeholders. Uh, could you give for us uh, foreign journalists an overview and a background of how this international anti-corruption -co academy works and how it help and how it helps society? Thank you. Well, the, the mandate is very simple, facilitating implementation of the convention. Mm -hmm. You know, the, international, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption entered into force 17 years ago. After it was negotiated for two years in Vienna, opened for signature in Mexico, in Merida, it entered into force 17 years ago. And, you know, but people don't know about it yet. If you go out and ask people, do you think you can fight corruption? Most people will tell you, I don't think so. You know, it's dangerous. You know, we can't do it. What is corruption? So the first thing is, you know, this UN uh, capacity that we call advocacy, helping people understand what is in their own interest. That today we can fight corruption because we have a legal system, the legal base to do it. We no longer have to accept being abused, being taken advantage of. We have a legal instrument, global legal instrument to fight corruption in each one of the 189 countries if the norms of the convention are implemented. So with the, this global approach, of course, fighting corruption is no longer individualistic. It's no personal luxury, but it becomes a societal economic imperative. As Jonathan has said, you know, corruptive practices are siphoning off enormous amounts of money every year from productive economies, money which is missing. It cannot be compensated for, neither by direct investments, nor by official development assistance, nor by remittances. This money is missing. It's a huge gap. Now, this money also undermines every aspect of society. We know that the cost of corruption to each country are enormous. How big, we don't really know, by the way, because you know this is something uh, quite interesting. Uh, we cannot measure corruption. We have not agreed to measure corruption. We can only estimate it. You know, so we know the sums are tremendous, and uh, Jonathan referred to some of the sums. Uh, but all the, the, the indexes that we have now are corruption perception index. So this is why we are right now running a global program measuring corruption, but maybe we can talk about this later. So we all agree that corruption is no longer acceptable. It undermines the political system, the societies, our capacity to build social safety nets, uh, to provide access to law, access to clean water, access to education, access to uh, pension benefits. You know, all of this is hindered by corruption. And then the third step is how to fight corruption in practical terms. How do we do that? You know, how, what is our role in the fight against corruption? Okay, first, don't accept it, you know, point to it. You know, perpetrators always try to hide things. So access to transparency and to information is the first step to fight corruption. So one of the, of the most relevant provisions of the convention is the so-called whistleblower uh, uh, provision. You know, people who help us gain access to information by sharing data which are not open uh, to general use. Now, this, by the way, this chapter is very weak because we could not really uh, not agree on a strong formulation because whistleblower is very, you know, as a journalist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, this is a very sensitive issue. You know, even in democracies, even in advanced democracies, 
whistleblowers are normally not well protected. Uh, they always interpreted going against the national interest and they're exiled, they're put to jail. You know, but it's a, but it's a very important uh, function to fight corruption. Same as journalism. Investigative journalists, you know, they provide access. They put, you know, this from Brazil, you know, hacking, you know, this whole uh, process of, of uh, you know, putting into the light the collusion between the judge and the prosecutors in a recent anti-corruption case, you know, was only put into the open by investigative journalists. You know, this was transformative. It has a transformative impact on society. So fighting corruption, bringing transparency, forcing decision makers, politicians, those who assume responsibility to be transparent and to be accountable for what they're doing is part of the larger fight against corruption. So it is not only the fight against corruption in front of at the courts, by judicial systems, it's building a culture of transparency, mm -hmm. anti-corruption, compliance, accountability, which we need to achieve. So this is the goal of my academy, of my institution. We're the only international institution that concentrates on the holistic fight against corruption. There are many players out there who also fight corruption, different ways, different levels, different aspects. But we're the only ones who concentrate on the holistic fight against corruption. And we are also at the same time the only international organization that is an uh, institution of higher learning. We are authorized to offer academic degrees. So to bring it down to the point, you know, we offer technical assistance, capacity building through education. Our central pillar is academic education. So we offer four masters program against corruption. You know, one addresses the practitioners, the lawyers, prosecutors, judges, judicial personnel. One addresses the private sector. Very important because in the context of the OECD anti-bribery convention, which is much smaller than the anti-corruption convention, only has 44 ratifiers, but the implementation process of which is very much advanced. That means for, companies working internationally in order to continue making money in national economies, they have to abide by new standards in the context of implementation of the anti-bribery convention. Now to apply, to abide by the standards, they need knowledge, they need technical assistance, capacity. Building. Where do they get this from? Either from the private sector consultants who charge them private sector fees or from the intergovernmental sector where it's only us. Mm -hmm. So we're working with UN Global Compact, we're working with the World Economic Forum, we're working with many chambers of commerce to make our expertise also available to the private sector. Our third academic program addresses diplomats, because to run this global issue of anti-corruption, you, you, you need to know what you're talking about. Now, this is a new issue. It has been mainstreamed into the global agenda only very recently. So unless you were posted in Vienna with a long tradition of fighting corruption, uh, you have never been exposed to that. So I thought a few years ago to prepare diplomats for the future debate on corruption, we have to offer them you know, a platform where they can learn how to deal with it. So uh, you know, my organization is very small and I see ourselves a little bit as a, as a startup. We are very often trying to provide answers to future questions. So we conceptualized this master's program together with UNITA, the research branch of the United Nations, to train mid-level diplomats and managers of the international system to prepare themselves for the future debate on corruption, which only emerged now recently, last January, in, United, in the United Nations in New York, when we started preparing for this year's SDG summit in September. Our fourth program is small. Our fourth program is a Spanish program. Because you know, all our programs are English, but many of the anti-corruption specialists in Spanish-speaking countries tell us they don't speak enough English to follow to, to get to benefit really from our programs. It's okay, fine. If there's interest, a critical mass, uh, we create a program in Spanish, which we went live with last year. We're in the second cohort. Uh, still a small program, but very useful. We have a lot of high-level people and very interesting multipliers in this. Uh, program. So these are four academic programs. You know, I don't want to drown you in words, but just very quickly, our second pillar is what we call tailor-made programs. It's capacity building non-academic. Here we work on demand. Our partners come to us 
anybody. It can be countries, it can be public institutions, national anti-corruption commissions, uh, think tanks, uh, journalists, for example, who need anti-corruption training. And we provide that. So we sit down, demand-driven, focused, impact-oriented. We conceptualize a project. Once we agree on the scope, duration, budget also, we conclude a contract, and then we mobilize our global network of experts who implement this project, which can be anything from training civil, civil, uh, civil servants. You know, we have trained thousands of civil servants in Soviet success states. There's a big demand. You know, we are doing webinars, uh, we're doing courses, instructor-led courses on issues as diverse as corruption in the fisheries in the environment, in the public health system. We are training uh, public procurement uh, specialists. We are training people in the sports. That's our new strong uh, growth area is sports transparency, sports integrity. You know, this is a fast growing field, with a lot of opportunities uh, for, for illicit financial flows. So we're working there. So, you know, corruption is like a cancer. It metastasis to every aspect of society. So we need to have an answer to fight corruption in every aspect of society. This is what we try to provide. About the, the third column, our research column, I talk a little bit later. So I give you an opportunity uh, to pose a question in the meantime. Thank you for your patience. You know, you know it just hit me there that uh, uh, I've done several conferences at the Carter Center with President Carter and, and had the honor of discussing things with his, with his, with his wife. And she had a program where each year she brought a group of journalists, a substantial group of journalists, for a deep dive in mental health education, because she, that she felt that there was an inadequate understanding of the issue and an inadequate coverage of the way in which mental health is addressed. Mm -hmm. And those journalists, when issues came up, had the deep background to identify it as a significant issue and thus help mainstream addressing it, at least in the United States. It, it, it might be worthwhile to explore with the Foreign Correspondents Association because we do executive, executive programs. I mean, we give master's degrees at IACA, but we also do specialized training to do a, a program for journalists because journalists, in, in, the, in the issue of anti-corruption, journalists are on the firing line. There will be no effective uh, efforts at promoting uh, good governance anywhere without, without fr freedom of the press. Uh, the last two Nobel laureates. But, but, we have been, but, we, but we have been doing this, Jonathan. We offer this program called The Power of the Pen, which we have been doing in Europe. We are now running it in six Francophone African countries, and we're going to expand this to Latin America, helping journalists to learn how to investigate uh, just more powerfully. And then, of course, you know, in some countries, also what to do once they've investigated, how to preserve their life. You know? okay. So this is a very individualized training adapted to the needs of the respective country, power of the pen, which has the potential to be scaled up so we can reach out to a huge number of journalists who can benefit from these programs, not only to understand corruption, but to understand how to do their job better, to provide transparency, information as the preconditions to get a better understanding and a better infrastructure for corruption. With the Foreign Correspondents Association, the interplay of, of of uh, journalists from all over the world would be amplified. Uh, so m maybe something very tangible will come of this discussion with your very, very wonderful shop. There's an issue, uh, an aspect of corruption that we haven't touched upon, which is uh, <clears throat> nobody washes a rental car. Nobody right? washes a rental car. Right, because they don't own it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the uh, if you look at the economies of the world, the most successful economies of the world are the ones in which the citizenry has confidence that their votes and their engagement in civic affairs has results that benefit them. And if you look at the most uh, the most degraded economies of the world, you will see a breakdown of that relationship. 
And that is exactly what one of the elements that, that is uh, systemic that we have to address, which is the relationship between governance and corruption. Because when governance is controlled by bribery, when the leaders of states steal from the public treasury, the people lose confidence in governance. When governance is weakened, civil strife is amplified. When civil strife is amplified, economies fail. So uh, that, that's an immeasurable, an immeasurable consequence of corruption. Not just the dollars that are stolen, but the governance aspects, the governance aspects of it. For that, for that reason, uh, when we start talking about uh, uh, applying the principles of the convention, the cultural aspect that Ambassador Stelzer talked about, creating a culture of accountability, culture of transparency, that's the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, texture, the framing of issues, the framing of issues that journalists and journalists alone can do well to frame issues in terms of, in terms of addressing corruption. When you say uh, frame issues, uh, it means identifying uh, aspects of each situation or in each country, right? And so that's why not always a broader view, it's, it's enough to, to talk about. Well, it's also, if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the agenda for the international community for 2030, there's 17 of them. They include addressing, protecting the climate, addressing gender equity, addressing poverty elimination. They include all the aspects of, of human, uh, human life. And one of the uh, academic exercises that I think will be of great value to the international community that IACA is doing is analyzing how corruption affects every single one of those elements. That it is, uh, that, that if you look at the, the SD, the Sustainable Development Goals and the UN Convention Against Corruption, the two very much overlap in, in, in one of the SDGs on good governance, SDG 16, which means that in order to address water, in order to the, 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 the providing of water for everybody, the providing of energy and electricity, the providing of daily life security, the providing of education, the providing of food, the providing of all of the services that depend on good governance. Corruption is central to that. So mainstreaming, mainstreaming corruption and its effect on every one of those issues needs to be highlighted in reportage. Um, Mr. Gurov, I would like to uh, go to another um topic which is um the the main um the main goal of the global security institute but before that um ambassador stelzer do you have anything else to add regarding ayaka um am i pronouncing right because i said i said before i think in a wrong way and you said no. <laughs> are you finalizing um uh your speech you said you had a third element to add if i am if yeah, I just wanted, you know, to complete what we are doing. You know, we are, you know, we are a technical organization. We're an international organization, intergovernmental. We have right now 80 signatories with a growing number. Several countries have expressed interest to work with us. And we are part of the sustainable development network and institutions. So uh, facilitating implementation of the convention in all different aspects, through providing the consistent capacity building, but also through research. And that's a very important issue in my eyes. You know, I'm a strong believer in evidence-based decision-making. And we have to provide hard facts to our decision-makers to help them strengthen their narrative. So if a decision-maker, a politician says, I want to fight corruption because we can no longer afford corruption. You know, what does this mean? You know, people will ask him, what do you mean? We can no longer afford corruption. What is the price? He has to say, we don't know. We cannot measure. So we try to also provide hard facts to strengthen narratives. First, where do you get hard facts from? From research. Now, there's a lot of anti-corruption research out there, which is very fragmented. So we are building right now a virtual repository of all anti-corruption research, mm -hmm. a one-stop shop 
So everybody who needs a response to a question can click herself or himself through our homepage to a response. That's a service. Second level, we are trying to identify gaps in research. And there are many. You know, where we look at gaps, just to give you a few. The politically most interesting and relevant chapter of, of the convention is asset recovery. You know, recovering assets that have been embezzled, stolen, uh, transferred abroad uh, by authorities, you know, parked in yeah. national systems in the hope that they, they can be used uh, later. Now, these assets, we, we can't measure them, but they're huge. Estimates go in many, many trillions. So uh, the convention contains a chapter asset recovery. You know, we agreed on a way how we can repatriate these stolen assets into the country, into the society where it belongs to. Now, this is a very hopeful area and it's a very complex because it, it needs a lot of conditions to, to, to put life into these uh, provisions. And I have to say, 13 years uh, after, uh, 17 years after entry to force the convention, uh, 12 years after the World Bank Star initiative, we have only recovered 1% of the assets that we are aiming for. Because we still don't know exactly how international cooperation is to look like, how information exchange is to look like, you know, how mutual legal assistance has to look like. What do we do with the assets once they have been identified and frozen in economic cycles? Mm -hmm. you know, which steps are necessary to set process into motion? We don't know all of this. So we need research to, to, to push this agenda and we can come to an understanding of how to move on. Or, you know, the biggest of all the gaps, of course, measuring of corruption. We can't measure corruption. We don't agree on a system to measure corruption. So I, I mentioned this already, all the indexes we have are corruption perception indexes, you know, which again, don't strengthen our narrative. So this is why we finally are running now a global program on measuring corruption. You know, this has been the outcome of uh, the G20 process. Uh, Saudi Arabia ran the G20. They put a lot of interest in there together with Italy and other countries. And they uh, started a, a program which we took over and we are running this now a global program measuring corruption with the goal to come up with a consensus on how to measure corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a very complex area. It's a complex area and it's a good topic, how to measure uh, corruption and yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't know yet how to, you know, we are right now, we are consulting everybody who has anything to contribute to see which elements of the existing 12, 10 methodologies could mm -hmm. be taken forward into a new methodology, which hopefully will enjoy consensus. So we all agree on a measurement that we can reflect the corruption, which will make our work much easier because much more concrete. So this is just our research department, just to give us some examples what to do there. So these are three pillars. And then of course our political work, because in the last year, I have to say, you know, corruption has become the emerging issue. Mm -hmm. You know, five years ago, it was nowhere. But with the introduction into the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, as Jonathan said, SDG 16, the goal which has to create the framework for the implementation of the 15 content SDGs. It has two anti-corruption targets. So fighting corruption has become the cross-cutting agenda of the SDGs. And it impacts on each one of the SDGs. So this makes corruption a much hotter issue today in resolving you know, the future of the world. We all have agreed that the implementation of the SDGs is the only way that we can pass a world in which it is well worth living in to our children. But how do we implement the SDGs? How do we raise the money to implement the SDGs with these trillions, trillions of dollars siphoned out of, a, of, of, of productive economies, which are missing for SDG implementation. So this is a big issue which hangs together and which surfaces now, it's everywhere. It's in the US initiative of Summit of Democracies, which is built on fighting corruption and fighting authoritarianism and human rights, but corruption is very strong in there. It's now in the, in the UN agenda, it's everywhere. It's building public trust to, to, uh, to strengthen a framework within which sustainable development can be implemented. And this is quite easy. 
you know, you know, Jonathan has, me has mentioned his peace, peace dividend, you know, it was a fallacy, a dream, you know, the dream was to, to limit military expenditure and with the dividend we gain, that could be re-channeled towards more productive purposes. It has not worked. We have not gained a penny because, you know, military expenditure has grown every year up to 2.1 2 trillion last year, and most likely it's gonna grow further with all the challenges we face. So this is another way. We know that there is no peace dividend. It's been confirmed by the way by the New York Times recently, by the Economist last week. So this is gone. So now we have to think, where can we tap the money that we can use for implementing the sustainable energy uh, debate? And here we have a very practical access, and the access is illicit financial flows. You know, which we have a handle on. You know, we know that this illicit financial flows consist of four elements: tax evasion, tax avoidance, bribery, and corruption. Now, on the tax issues, we have no clout. This is national, and countries defend these issues. But in bribery, we have the OECD anti-bribery convention, and in corruption, we have the UN anti-corruption convention. Implemented in 189 years, uh, countries. So 189 countries, which is the most, biggest part of the world, has committed to fight corruption by national law. If we do that, if we do what we have committed to, if we fight corruption successfully, what will be the results? We will limit illicit financial flows. By how much, we don't know, because we can also not quantify illicit financial flows. We can only estimate them. But there's huge amounts of money involved there. And even if we limit some of it, that we release new funds which our decision makers can invest now, invest either in offering the global goods, strengthening social safety nets. Maybe some of it will go into military expansion, I don't know, but some of it might go into sustainable development implementation. And this is what Jonathan mentioned before. So this is a new rate, a new opportunity, which we have coined as integrity dividend money which we can produce, it's in our, we have leverage on that, and which can then be used by decision makers to finance the future of the world, sustainable development. So I think this is a very important contribution, which we are doing now. So we are scaling this up. And this is maybe something that your, you and your colleague journalists might want to consider, you know, to run with this issue you know, to replace the military dividend, the peace dividend, with an integrity dividend, which is in our hands. If we mobilize our constituents to do what they have, they have they committed to do, we will produce this integrity dividend. And then we have really the financial means to take the next step, you know, to, imp to implement the, the system development course, and to provide for a better, safer, more inclusive, more just, uh, more integrated, more sustainable world for our children. So it's a very realistic approach. It's not, it's nothing academic here. It's just, I really believe that the fight against corruption is the precondition, it's the only leverage we have to limit illicit financial flows substantively to set the preconditions for, for SDG implementation. So it's a very, very clear, easy path, which I think uh, journalists could diffuse into the world as a recipe, as a strategy for hope and for the future, in which we have to be active players. understand mr granoff as you our um, one of our main goals here and is also to explain this topic and give background and overview and also to give ideas of stories uh, for journalists uh, from different parts of the world uh, regarding this matter um can you suggest any uh, specific approach in order um, to cover or analyze or tell this story about how to uh, transform this peace dividend to an uh, integrity dividend and how do we recapture massive stolen assets and make them available to serve uh, the real human needs. Sure. Stolen assets from uh, corruption in different parts of the world. 
Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think one of the points that Ambassador Stelzer made is that this is an existing commitment. We're not trying to create a legal framework. It exists already. And it is very important that citizens compel their political leadership to live up to their promises. That's, that's the link, by the way, between anti-corruption and nuclear weapons. There's already, there's already a legal obligation under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons. There already is a unanimous decision of the International Court of Justice reaffirming that duty to negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons. And it's not a small achievement when there was a political push to do that by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, which helped end the Cold War, that we've gone from over 65,000 down to less than 14,000. That's a considerable accomplishment, largely because journalists highlighted the issue, because there was a, a, a movie called The Day After that showed what a nuclear exchange would be. It was, it was the media and the journalists that helped create the public pressure for the change that helped end the Cold War that has prevented nuclear weapons from being used by condemning them. This public awareness is so important in, in this issue. So you asked for a tangible example, so I, 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 I like that. And I also, I agree, I, I agree very strongly that we need evidence-based advocacy we also need contextualization of the principles that are at stake here. The basic principle to me is that the continued pursuit of security by threatening to annihilate humanity with nuclear weapons by the major states of the world is the wrong bus. It's the wrong bus. It's the wrong bus. It goes to the wrong destination, it goes over a cliff. It's too risky, it's too expensive, and it institutionalizes adversity the values that it expresses that will pursue security by threatening global annihilation is unworthy of civilization. Whereas good governance, transparency, accountability, the rule of law, and simple honesty and integrity in social dealings at every level is the right bus. But we found that no community can exist without building trust and accountability in its leaders. Today, there's an, a whole set of global issues that require that level of cooperation. There's no other way to protect the rainforests, the oceans, the climate. That's, the, that's what the Sustainable Development Goals are about. And corruption, corruption impacts every single one of them. And the efforts of anti-corruption strengthen the social fabric and the legal fabric to address every one of them. And let me give an example. Our financial institutions have to be trusted. If we stop losing, if people stop losing faith in stock markets, stock exchanges, and banking, our, we'll be going back to bartering. I mean, who knows what will happen? It's, it's horrific. So it's very important that we trust it. And we do. I mean, people invest in stocks and bonds and they believe that their investments are going to have integrity. We do still have sufficient trust in our currencies. So, take an example. The uh, NASDAQ, one of a uh, very important stock exchange, we see it as a stock exchange. I, I recently had a dialogue with the head of it before the American Bar Association, uh, Adina Friedman, and uh, she was explaining that they conceptualize themselves as essentially an electronics and information uh, intellectual property, really, enterprise that happens to be a platform for trading, a bourse, if you will. But they view themselves as something beyond that, as a, uh, as a technology enterprise. Parenthetically, the Consumer Technology Association highlighted the SDGs at its recent big conference of over 100,000 people in Las Vegas, the, the heads of all the consumer electronics companies there, Google, Apple, Samsung, all of them, highlighting the need for technology to be used to fulfill these promises. So that sector can use has a program that uses artificial intelligence 
to identify illicit financial transactions. It's one of, the, one of the benefits of artificial intelligence is its ability to see patterns that would take our, our normal intelligence and the normal speed of computers years to identify. They can do it very quickly. Um, they are platforming that and commercializing it to banks all, all around the world and to stock exchanges all around the world in the belief that the stronger the integrity and trust in our markets, the better it is for all of us. But there's a, there's a lacuna, there's a gap between this technology, this, this opportunity that we have to identify illicit transactions and prevent them. And when they're identified, to enforce and prosecute them. And one of the reasons is we don't have sufficient international cooperation because the corrupt institutions, the, the people dealing with human trafficking, people dealing with uh, massive amounts of profits in illicit drugs, gun running, all of, these, all of these terrible, terrible scourges on the daily life of billions of people, the people engaged in that, they don't recognize law, they don't recognize national borders, and they're smart. And they're going to be using the new technologies to steal from all of us. At this point, at this point, we need capacity building of cooperation amongst the law enforcement operations of the world. Interpol is not strong enough. We need to have a culture of cooperation to address anti-corruption. We also need a population that says we want our institutions of governance to be focused on capacity building with the private sector to end corruption. That is a matter of public awareness. And that is precisely the job of journalists, to identify anti-corruption efforts such as the one I've just identified and let the public know about these things. And uh, that, that is, uh, right now, we have a, uh, a deficit between the political commitments to address corruption I mean, you look at the political declaration of the UN General Assembly of 2021. This is what the nations of the world agreed. We will strengthen, I'm going to quote from them. We will strengthen our fight against corruption in all its forms and at all levels and stress that corruption is an impediment to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and an obstacle to the efficient mobilization of resources and means for sustainable development. We recognize the importance of mainstreaming transparency and anti-corruption as a cross-cutting enabler for the broader development agenda and the need to incorporate anti-corruption measures in the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. So this is not known. I can tell you where I live in the suburbs of New York, if I were to talk to my neighbors about the political commitment of my nation to address anti-corruption that it has made with all of the nations of the world, they wouldn't know that. That's, and thus there's a gap between the capacity building that we need, the implementation that we know how to do, and the legal and commit political commitments that we've made. That gap, creates a lack of confidence in governance. And that gap has to be, that gap has to be corrected. And journalists, more than any other group, can help do that. Ambassador Stelzer, as uh, Mr. Granoff uh, mentioned at the beginning, the threat of nuclear uh, weapons. And um, Jonathan, I would like also your comment um, from the perspective as president of the Global Security Institute. But Ambassador, can we say, do you believe that corruption is an extra risk in countries where nuclear insecurity is a reality and where this concern is more latent or evident today in the world regarding both issues, nuclear threat and corruption? <laughs> well, they're both they're both global issues, of course, and uh, as you can know, you can, can extract no country from the nuclear threat, unfortunately. Uh, you cannot extract a country from corruption. There are two global issues. Now, of course, there are many connection points here. You know, uh, 
we all know there's a, a lot of corruption in every wherever you look there's corruption and uh, there's of course also corruption in the military markets you know in the procurement processes in every stage of these processes and corruption always undermines structures belief trust accountability so i can think of many i don't think there's much direct research on the effect of corruption on nuclear secu security as for example in the outcome document of the summit of democracies corruption is referred to as a security issue it's not substantiated it's an assumption because no research has been done here we all know it's true we all know we see it how corruption undermines society and security but no research has been done here so we are weak in our arguments so it's prudent to say there is a close connection between corruption and security including nu nuclear security but i think it would be very good to have some project to see what exactly is that that we can change the assumption into that we can substantiate this important uh, assumption which also in this process of democracies has been mainstreamed into a new global layer of discussion including the munich security conference you know where corruption has been taken up now as a security risk and it's being increasingly treated so this is just rounding off our discussion our picture that discussion that corruption unfortunately plays a various impacts on every aspect of life and of course nuclear security cannot be separated from human security you know if you are afraid you know the freedom from fear includes the freedom of war of the threat of war but it also includes food security it always includes access to opportunities access to the to justice you know so all of this is intermingled it comes together it's all intertwined it's like a big picture consisting of many puzzles who all in this is why our approach to fight corruption is inclusive it's multifaceted it's comprehensive not only thematically looking at all different aspects but also including all the players decision makers generals academics the private sector civil society of course every sector of society has to be included into an all inclusive approach otherwise we will not be able to build more resilient anti corruption systems you know which leads to a new culture of transparency accountability productivity peace security you know it's all it's just and it, you know it's it's it, 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 thinking of this you know it, all these associations that come into my head now you know i mean if you look for example into what are the, what are the if you look into pretty into, into realistic foreign policy issues like migration you know why are people fleeing their countries you know what could people keep where they are you know what is it access to opportunities building better legal systems better justice systems more accountability access to clean water medication access to the markets for the coffee farmer they can sell his products for a fair price and feed his family so they don't have to trust their life to coyotes and cross that deadly, deadly deserts you know to be confronted by military who push them back you know so the only solution you know the is look at the root causes the push factors and that can only be resolved by building more fair more law based more accountable systems rule of law access to justice human rights sustainable development inclusive integrative you know trustful engaging people and of course fighting corruption is in all of this uh, the threats you know it's just a strong principle which has to be mainstreamed in every policy decision in every conceptualization of a strategy it has to it has to become you know just a natural you know it just to become 
penetrating our thinking and our political actions, long term, short term. And uh, this is what we strive for, you know, to build a culture of integrity and a culture of a, cult a world without corruption, you know, as, or as, with li as little corruption as is feasible, let's put it like this. I'd, I'd like to jump in here as a, from the perspective of uh, an American, you know, uh, I I'm also have the privilege of, of being the permanent observer in the UN on this issue and seeing the debate that Ambassador Stelzer has just highlighted has become really mainstream. It's really important. But one of the political issues in my hometown here is immigration, is people coming to our southern border. Now, when you look at where they're coming from, they're not coming from Costa Rica. They're coming from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Mexico. Which of all of those countries has the greatest, the greatest freedom of the press, the highest level of social services and education, the best health care system in the region, and the least violation of human rights, and a rule of law that is relied upon by the population, and even in their interactions with other countries, most recently with Nicaragua, international law, taking matters to the International Court of Justice. Costa Rica. We don't have massive people coming to our border in Me at the border with Mexico from Costa Rica, whereas we do from all those other countries. And what's the difference? The difference is corruption. The difference is good governance. That's the difference. So this is an issue in which I can tell you people don't frame it that way. All they do is they look at what's happening at the border between Mexico and Texas. But, the, but if you take a step downstream, like who's throwing the, you know, we're dealing with pulling babies out of the river. Some of us say, let's go upstream and see why are the ba how are the babies being thrown in the river? Not, instead of dealing with just the consequences, the consequences of corruption, which is social disruption, poverty, suffering, tremendous suffering, we are saying, let's go upstream and let's, let's, let's prevent the babies from being thrown in the river. Let's People don't want to leave their homes and their communities unless they have to. They don't want, they don't leave Costa Rica. They're leaving countries where there's corruption. So we're saying there's a deep relationship between communities all over the world and this issue. One, one last thing before, I want to make sure we get this. To some extent, we've been talking very tangible. I just gave a tangible example. But to some extent, it's uh, because it's so broad and because it's so uh, comprehensive, people say, well, it's so idealistic because we're dealing with ideas as well as the practicality. I am very much opposed to the cynicism toward the power of ideas, the power of ought, we call it. And I'll speak as an American on this one. There was a visionary, an imperfect human being like all of us, named Thomas Jefferson, who at one time said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Today, today, when he said it, women were not included in that vision. Men without property were not included. Men and women of color were not included. Indigenous people were not included. But that ought has now grown to a very powerful principle, that the legitimacy of governance comes from those who are governed and that all people are equal in the eyes of the law. That was a revolutionary idea when it was put forward. And it was an ought, because at the time it certainly wasn't self-evident, or it is. That idea has changed the world. It changed the world because it's the foundation of good governance, that all people are equal under the law. I, I, so when people say, well, you know, ideas are it's very idealistic, I say, if we don't have ideals, if we don't have vision, then we don't have a compass, then we don't have direction. 
And one of the directions that's really needed now is addressing any, any form of cynicism to the importance of good governance, any form of cynicism toward the importance of putting ideals and principles forward. This is the, the anti-corruption efforts is all about human integrity, the integrity of government, the integrity of each of us in our relations. Each of us have, in, have integrity issues when we make a contract, when we shake hands on a deal, when we promise to show up on time. Those are integrity issues. Governments have to have the same principle, and the anti-corruption is the framework of addressing that, that integrity. Human beings without integrity can be very dangerous. <laughs> We're the most dangerous species on the planet. Human beings with integrity, integrity in our relations with the natural world and each other and amongst nations and our personal relations, integrity as a cultural principle is really important. And, and, and anti-corruption is where the rubber hits the road. And uh, that, so I just wanted to point out that, yes, it's very, it, this is sort of a convergence of what is doable, practical, uh, uh, efficient, you know, high, efficient, and also moral. There's a moral dimension to integrity. It is very intrinsic to our being human, in being reliable partners with other people. And governments have to be held to account in this regard. And journalists can do more to, to do that than almost any other sector. Thank you so much, Jonathan Granoff, Ambassador Thomas, Stelzer, your final thoughts, please, regarding this matter and any message you would like to add for us international journalists, our audience who is here uh, watching uh, us, anything you think might be helpful for, for us regarding this matter, Ambassador. Well, I hope that we were able to, to bring you on board to join the Global Fight Against Corruption. You know, which is in the interest of all of us. As I said before, it's not an individual luxury to fight corruption, but it's a societal and economic imperative. You know, to make our world sustainable, uh, we just need to start somewhere. And the where is where we have a legal base, a legal framework. And the UN Convention Against Corruption offers this legal framework. It gives us very clear guidance what to do, how to build institutions that are efficient, that impact, how to choose people in the institutions, you know, not family members, but on, uh, on a meritocratic uh, uh, you know, level, how to financially support institutions, how to keep them out of, of political games, how to keep them independent, accountable. All of this in the convention. So we just have to read it and we have to uh, implement as many of the provisions as possible. It's a clear guidance, a checklist. You know, it's just, it's quite, I see this very practical. I'm a very practical person, you know. And uh, of course, you know, we need some idealism, but we just need practical steps, you know. And it's very, it's clear. We have agreed on the way forward. We have agreed on the SDGs. We have agreed on the agenda 2030 on the implementation of the SDGs. So now we have identified a way to finance implementation. So it's in our power to limit illicit financial flows by doing exactly what we have committed to fight corruption based on our national laws. If we do that, you know, we will succeed. So it's quite easy. So journalists, of course, help us build this alliance, this understanding with our constituents, uh, bring them into the game, inform them, tell them, empower them, you know, make them actors, citoyens, mobilize them, and help them understand that it's in their own interest, personal interest, the family's interest, the village's interest, to integrate the mainstream anti-corruption contents into urban politics, into local politics, into federal politics, into the juridical system, into the school system, into the families, into every aspect of life. And you know, you, you journalists, you have this amazing power to articulate this understanding what is and to articulate issues and to translate them in a way that people understand them. You know, people of all layers, you know, 
uh, elite media boulevard, you know, but it's, uh, it's just a, a different form how to reach out. And it's a, I would see it as a journalistic responsibility to also transport content and to not only uh, try to reach more le readers uh, to sell advertisements, but to reach out to more leaders to, you know, to move things a little bit forward. So if we can just, uh, you know, reserve a part of our impact, that would have been a great outcome uh, of today's meeting. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy and grateful that you gave us the opportunity uh, to explain these issues, you know, in more than two phrases or a paragraph, as it's so often, but to have a good conversation where you ask the appropriate questions and gave us the opportunity to come back with responses, which we hope will benefit uh, our audience. So I thank you very much. It was great meeting you and uh, thank you. We truly appreciate Ambassador Thomas Estell, sir. Jonathan Granoff, any, any final thoughts? Well, first I want to, uh, my, uh, my, my final thought is my first thought, which is thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to actually uh, flesh out an idea, flesh out a practice, flesh out the vision, and flesh out the reality that there are solutions. Um, we're at a point in human history, uniquely, in which the admonition to see the human family as one, which has always been a spiritual, moral admonition, has now become a practical necessity. We, can, we have to deal with corruption in our personal lives, in our communities, in our states, in our cities, in our nations. But corrupt, the corrupt actors, the corrupt actors who deal in human trafficking, drug running, uh, weapon sales, all of these horrific endeavors, illicit financial transactions, tax avoidance, tax evasion, these are all transnational. They're global. That's unique. That wasn't the case a hundred years ago. We didn't live in a world in which that spiritual insight of the unity of the human family is, was a practical necessity. We need a global practical application of the commitments that nations have made. And politicians will not live up to their commitments unless there's public pressure to do so. And unless there's accountability by the public, politicians, as all human beings, are susceptible to vice and corruption. And that's why I highlighted the idea of the rule of law and the, accountability and the, the legitimacy of governance and why governance is so important. And in order for that essential element to be effective, People need to be informed. That's why I'm so grateful for this conversation. And I hope that there'll be journalists when there is a news cycle item, a news cycle item, that you'll come to Ambassador Stelzer or, or myself or other people who are passionate about this central issue so that we can give a contextualization of that news cycle item. Like, for example, I use the example of the immigration issue in the United States. It has not been properly conceptualized as essentially a governance and corruption matter. Because if you just take a step downstream, you'll see that's essentially what this is all about. That there's a bunch of countries where there's been corruption. They're trying to deal with it. They need help. They want to change. They want to get better. We can see that. But the country that doesn't have systemic corruption like the others. People are not running to our borders. And that should be highlighted. I'm just a simple example of a tangible step that could be done. Use this framework. And giving us the opportunity to, to, you know, to, to, to highlight this, uh, I just want to close by saying thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jonathan Granoff, president of the Global Security Institute and a 2014 nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. No, no, and the permanent observer for the International Anti-Corruption Academy in the General Assembly of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, both insights and for being here uh, with us for almost one hour and a half. And I know both of you have such uh, intense agenda. So thank you very much. Uh, we are ending here our educational program addressing the massive global impact of corruption from the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States. Thank you very much. Have a great day, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.